Yeah, thank you. Um, certainly a pleasure to open today's session on equatorial dynamics. Um, I'll be talking about the diurnal cycle in the equatorial Atlantic. And I start with this photo of sunset over the Atlantic Ocean, which was taken from the International Space Station, because I think it emphasizes in this really nice way how fundamental this time scale is to the entire Earth system. And it's, it's actually been the subject of scientific inquiry for several hundreds of years since shortly after uh, the invention of the thermometer with a variety of quite well-documented effects on both the atmosphere and ocean. And one particularly interesting aspect of the diurnal cycle are the dynamic effects on the equat equatorial ocean where near-surface stratification builds during daylight hours and in the presence of a surface wind stress leads to a sheer diurnal jet, which you can see a bit here. And recent work by Bill Smythe and co-authors working at 140 West in the Pacific showed how the descent of this diurnal shear layer following the base of the afternoon and evening mixed layer could provide the perturbation necessary to initiate these large deep cycle turbulent events uh, shown here in turbulent dissipation rate. Um, and so this provides, we know that the, this deep cycle turbulence um, plays a very fundamental role in the seasonal uh, mixed layer heat budget on the equator. And so I think this provides this very nice example of how the ocean dynamic response to, on the diurnal time scale can directly affect this measure of very widespread and, and broad importance and interest. Now, as it turns out, our knowledge of deep cycle turbulence and to a large extent the diurnal cycle in the tropics comes almost exclusively from work done in the Pacific, with the Atlantic in particular remaining very sparsely sampled. Um, this is despite a number of, of relatively pressing issues in the Atlantic, not the least of which are serious model biases in SST in the cold tongue region uh, that persist into the CMIP-5 class of models. So there have been a number of recent field campaigns um, to help address these gaps in our knowledge. Uh, notably, the Tropical Atlantic Climate Experiment, which contained a large microstructure measurement component. And work is still being published from this, but I think it's fair to say that the emerging picture is one of similar deep cycle turbulence, perhaps reduced in strength a bit relative to the Pacific. Um, but notably, the diurnal cycle of turbulence has not been clearly resolved in observations in the Atlantic. In fact, with some suggestion of daytime enhancement of turbulence, rather than nighttime uh, enhancement as we see in the Pacific. So some, some interesting open questions. And today, the work I'm going to discuss are really some first results looking at the near-surface diurnal cycle in the equatorial Atlantic with a real focus on the role of ocean dynamics. And while we don't have direct dissipation measurements as part of this work, we will specifically focus on several questions designed to link to some of the exciting work coming out of the Pacific, namely, do we observe the descending diurnal shear layers that were shown in the Pacific to provide uh, initiation for this deep cycle turbulence, and is there any indirect evidence at this location of deep cycle turbulence? So in order to do this, we utilize data from the 023 West mooring, which is shown highlighted here on climatological plots of SST, wind stress, and contours of outgoing long wave radiation. And you can see that this moraine sits at the western extent of the Atlantic cold tongue. Seasonal variability is really dominated by the north-south shifting of the ITCZ here, which you can see in boreal winter pretty clearly. Uh, we use surface moraine measurements to calculate surface fluxes with the core three bulk algorithm. And in addition to the standard suite of subsurface observations that are associated with Parada and Tau moraines, uh, my results today, which I'll discuss, really highlight an enhanced monitoring period where there are two ADCPs deployed. One was deployed on the mooring bridle facing downwards, and the other was co-located facing upwards. And together, they provided hourly horizontal current spanning all the way from three and three-quarter meter down to 150 meters. So quite a unique um, data set of a very near surface velocity. Okay, so the record begins in October of 2008, spanning through June of 2009. You can see that the early part of the record is really characterized by the steady southeasterly trade winds and very limited diurnal SST variability. And what I'm plotting here is the amplitude of the diurnal harmonic from the one meter temperature sensor. So this is a bulk measure of SST. You can see that we don't see these large SST excursions uh, at the diurnal period during this time. And you can contrast that to later in, in the record where consistent with that climatology, the ITCZ has shifted south winds are lighter and more variable, and we start seeing these large amplitude diurnal uh, temperature ranges. 
Zonal velocity is really dominated by the strong eastward flowing equatorial undercurrent, which shoals uh, beginning in January through March, a response to the basin scale relaxation of winds. And meridional vol velocity is generally limited here, except for the evidence, the signature of several tropical instability waves early in the record. So in order to discuss the diurnal cycle, today I'll focus primarily on composites uh, formed from these two time periods. The first I'll call the steady trade wind conditions. The latter part of the record I'll call variable wind forcing conditions. Okay, so the diurnal composite during steady trades. At top is the net surface heat flux defined here positive into the mixed layer, followed by the one meter diurnal temperature anomaly. Again, it's quite limited during this time period. Below that, the color scale indicates the time, so this is local hour, depth, temperature anomaly, with wind vectors shown on the zero line, and then currents relative to 20 meters, so the sheared component of the flow at their observation depth, and the vector convention is shown here on the left. And so you'll note that in the morning, uh, when the net surface heat flux begins to warm the layer, uh, there's a rapid shoaling of the mixed layer. Stratification builds throughout the day along with this diurnal jet. And these shears reach, um, on average, 20 centimeters per second relative to 20 meters. So this is a strongly uh, sheared flow. In the afternoon going into the evening, the mixed layer deepens, and these temperature anomalies are spread over an increasingly deep layer, really limiting that near-surface expression. We can also infer an eddy viscosity, and we do this using the surface shear stress boundary condition. You can see the definition here. And so we calculate wind stress using the mooring observations, and we use our observed shear at five meters. So this is an approximate eddy viscosity. And it, too, shows this very strong diurnal modulation of mixing with daytime minimums found around 1,400 local, reduced a, about a factor of three from the pre-dawn maximum, and then increasing steadily throughout the afternoon hours, reflecting the deepening of this mixed layer. We can contrast that to the variable wind conditions where right away you'll notice that the temperature anomaly is strongly surface trapped. It also persists later in the day, allowing these larger amplitude one meter signals to build. And I'll note that this is despite the net surface heat flux being reduced during this time period because of cloudiness associated with the ITCZ. So this really suggests the first order role that ocean mixing is playing in controlling this diurnal SST amplitude. You'll see the mixed layer is shallow throughout the diurnal cycle, and we don't see that rapid afternoon deepening that we saw in the steady trade wind forcings. And consistent with this, eddy viscosity is reduced approximately an order of magnitude here, and there's very little evidence of a diurnal cycle of mixing. So we can also look at the stability characteristics of this layer. And in order to do this, uh, we use reduced shear squared, which is defined in the title here. And this is simply a rearrangement of the Richardson number, such that when the Richardson number is below one quarter, so subcritical Richardson numbers, reduced shear squared is positive. And what's being plotted here is the fraction of observations in each time depth bin with reduced shear squared positive, so the fraction of observations um, that are susceptible to shear instability. And you'll note that in both cases, in both forcing regimes, in the morning hours, as the mixed layer shoals, there's a stabilization of the near surface water column as stratification builds. However, in the steady trade wind conditions, beginning approximately midday, we start to see destabilization of the water column. That's associated with that additional shear building from the diurnal jet uh, going into the rapid deepening of the mixed layer as well. You can contrast that to the variable wind condition where the stability persists throughout much of the day and really doesn't uh, begin to uh, decrease until after the net surface heat flux changes sign uh, and we start seeing convective mixing. I'll also note that during the variable wind conditions below about 20 meters, we see fairly limited evidence of a diurnal cycle, really uh, highlighting how limited the vertical penetration is of these surface forced anomalies during this time. So I'll step back briefly and show about a week period of data from early in the record. So this is during the steady trade wind forcing condition. Uh, and I'll note the similarities to what we observe um, to what Bill Smythe saw in the Pacific. You know, namely that we see evidence, particularly on these strongly stratified days of the descent of a diurnal shear layer, again along the base of the mixed layer. And these mixed layers are, are very frequently deepening before the surface heat flux has changed sign. It's associated with subcritical Richardson numbers as well, again suggestive of the role of shear instabilities in the late afternoon, mixing this layer and limiting those temperature anomalies. And so while we don't have direct measurements of turbulence, 
These processes were shown fairly directly in the Pacific to provide an initiation for deep cycle turbulence. So we can look at the stability characteristics below the mixed layer um, to infer indirectly whether we see deep cycle turbulence. So shown on the left are median profiles of reduced shear squared width depth, again segmented by these two time periods, so the steady trade wind forcing and the variable wind forcing. And then on the right is the distribution in this 22 to 50 meter depth range. And you'll see right away that during the steady trade wind conditions that this distribution of reduced shear squared is sharply peaked around the critical value of zero, as opposed to during the variable wind forcing condition when this layer is increasingly stable with depth. And this is characteristic, this peak around a critical value is quite characteristic of a flow that's in what's called marginal instability. And recent work, again, coming out of the Pacific, 140 West, uh, really enabled by the long Kaipod measurements at that location, demonstrated how this can be a useful proxy for the existence of deep cycle turbulence, particularly well suited for evaluation from moored records such as these. And just to be slightly more quantitative about it, um, we can apply the parameterization of Kunze et al. 1990 as an estimate of the turbulent dissipation rates implied in this layer. And we see um, dissipation rates on the order of 10 to the negative 6, 10 to the negative 7 watts per kilogram, uh, and then reduced by about an order of magnitude during the variable wind forcing conditions. So these are numbers consistent both with um, the limited microstructure measurements at this location, as well as indirect estimates of the seasonal cycle uh, from heat budgets. So in summary, these high resolution velocity observations really provide quite a unique view into the near surface dynamics and, and particularly unusual for the equatorial Atlantic. And they highlight, I think, in a very nice manner how critical the ocean dynamic response is on these time scales and how these near surface mixing processes uh, set the diurnal SST anomaly, which is so important for atmospheric boundary layer processes. Then in connection with the, the recent literature from the Pacific, we too see regular descent of a diurnal shear layer. Uh, also associated with subcritical Richardson numbers. And indirect evidence such as marginal instability of the layer below the mixed layer and the elevation of these, these estimated, these indirectly estimated turbulent dissipation rates are both suggestive of deep cycle turbulence at this location. Um, and finally, I'll just conclude by saying that I think that there's a variety of interesting comparisons which this enables uh, to the literature from the Pacific and we expect to see a lot of interesting work coming out of the, the Atlantic over the following years. Thanks. speculate. I like to do this to graduate students. Um, so what, so we have these deep turbulence layers. What effect do these things have on the biology when they're occurring? Yeah, that's a great question and biology certainly has never been my strong suit. Um, you know, we know that they're quite important for heat flux, for momentum flux, and thus I don't think it's too far of a speculation to say that they would be important for nutrient fluxes and, and other things of that nature, and perhaps biological fluxes. Um, these are, you know, the mechanism here is really these large overturning events, kind of Kelvin-Homholtz instabilities, um, which obviously has implications for mixing across the thermocline and, and at the top of the thermocline. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.